It's the George Plaster Show. 30 years of the best sports talk in Middle Tennessee. Featuring Tennessee Sports Hall of Famer, Watson Brown. And it's a shame it's taken this long to get an introduction for this Tennessee Sports Hall of Famer, Kelly Holcomb, along with young gun, Billy Derrick. And now, here's your host, George Plaster. Hello again, everybody. Welcome in. It's anything but a beautiful day in Nashville. As all of you know, there's a lot of weather stuff swirling around. Right now, uh, it appears that we are under a tornado watch until 3 p.m. However, based on what I'm looking at over there on the Weather Channel, um, that's the least of our issues right now. Uh, don't be surprised uh, if later in the day we end up with things like tornado warnings and hail and all kinds of stuff. It's going to get crazy. So check your weather. And if something happens where we need to bail early, uh, we will do that. Um, I'm broadcasting from my house. Kelly, of course, is in Murfreesboro. Let's bring him up. He is at his uh, abode. How are you? Hey, good, George. How you doing? I'm good. Thank you. Um, been watching the Weather Channel a little. This is going to get hairy. I know you have. I know you're keeping us abreast of the situation, Daniel Breezy. I yeah, you know, uh, Kelly, I, I got caught in one of these, um, and I remember the date very well, April 16th of 1998 we were supposed to have um oh gosh um football coach at arkansas i can't think of him all of a sudden um, houston nut houston nut and um about 10 minutes before we were going on the air the gaylord corporate building basically a block and a half away got just just demolished and yeah. so i made the decision that we were gonna not do a lot of sports talk that day uh gonna do a lot of uh weather stuff and i remember we had greg ruff out uh we sent him downtown and uh we had what ended up happening a second tornado hit um uh, in downtown about an hour and a half later and Supposedly, those things don't happen very often in right. a downtown area. I will always make the claim that because it missed the Titans under construction stadium at the time by, you know, hundreds of yards. If that thing had hit and torn down what was under construction, it's my opinion the Titans would never have come here. Really? You don't think yeah. so? I think they would have. Well, because I think it would have delayed the process for another two to three years. And I don't think they could spend another two to three in Houston. I really don't. Yeah, I remember when uh, I was still playing. I was actually in Indianapolis. And I can remember um, one of my wife's friends was talking about how it went through downtown Nashville. And I'm not a big fan of these storms, man. I don't like them. We had one up here last year, and it, uh, it hit Reedyville, which is about – you know, 10 miles away from us, man, it's just, uh, it's devastating when, uh, you know, I always say like on these tornadoes, if it hits you, you got problems. Now you could be 50 yards from it and, you know, it's probably do a little bit of damage, but it is not going to knock you over. But man, that stuff is, it's just scary. And some of these storms that roll through here nowadays, I, I feel like this is the new tornado alley instead of Kansas. I mean, everything comes through here yeah. and stuff is really getting violent, uh, in springtime these days. Clarksville has been uh, an area that has gotten hit a bunch. Uh, I don't yeah. know scientifically what the reason for that is. I just know it's happened. 
Uh, right. Anyway, let's check in with Billy, who is also at his house. Billy, I don't pretend to know exactly what a Torcon is, but the weather <laughs> thing does, and they say they say we've got uh, a five and ten shot. Uh, through what they call the Torcon. And I've never seen before up in Lexington and Cincinnati and Columbus, they've got the Torcon at seven, which is very likely to have tornadoes. I've never seen that number before. Yeah, it, it does. It kind of feels like we're bracing for something. I know Kelly's in, in Murfreesboro, almost more middle of the state. So Murfreesboro might, might be safe. I, I could be wrong. Uh, because it's kind of coming down. I know Lexington, Kentucky, like Kentucky's campus um, was getting drilled. I don't think it's anything super serious, but like the winds and the and the rain were pretty serious. So, uh, but yeah, Kelly, you're right. It's kind of crazy these last couple years. I feel like we're we've been getting nailed this Middle Tennessee area for whatever reason. I guess we need to do some more research on what the Torcon is. Maybe that has something to do with it. Charlie, I know you're in your palatial digs today, but did your mommy make you some warm milk before you went on the air? <laughs> yeah, she did. I got up before noon, too. Yeah. Yes, you're growing yeah. up, dude. Sure you did. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm watching right now. They've got a reporter. Covington, Kentucky is basically like 10 feet from Cincinnati. And they were showing the Bengals stadium. And if you knew what you were looking for, you could see – the Cincinnati Red Stadium. In fact, I'm looking at it right now, and they've got bright sunshine. And I'm told that in these kind of conditions, that's the worst yeah, thing you can yeah, have. Yeah, that's not good because it heats up the atmosphere. Right. So you got a little staff meteorological stuff going I there. Do, yeah, right? absolutely. Absolutely. I listen. Okay. <laughs> Billy, do we uh, have uh, any kind of an update in our future? Uh, yeah, we've got an award-winning update. We're gonna we're gonna oh, kick it off with. <laughs> we'll, we'll we'll see if it's award-winning. Me and George, we'll see if it's award-winning. We'll, we'll still got stuff going on. Like, what are we doing, man? Have you got some lozenges? I mean, do something. Good <laughs> gracious, man! You've had it for two weeks. Have you got we're COVID again? The show. <laughs> I mean, what are we doing? <laughs> I mean, go drink some hot tea or something, dude. <laughs> what, what are we doing to uh, recuperate? <laughs> Come on, Billy. Oh, Kelly, man. Um, well, we're we're watching Caitlin Clark to uh, to try to try to recuperate last night. Forty one points as Iowa beats LSU ninety four to eighty seven. She had twelve assists, seven rebounds, uh, breaking even more records in what has been a record shattering senior season and uh we also saw Angel Reese foul out of that game and you know I, I it's weird it in these kind of revenge situations you know you look at this and you go okay Iowa has all the motivation they had all the motivation and they won the game and George lost his bet yeah get over it <laughs> you know that's that's a lot of times that's why you need to keep your mouth shut when you start waving to girls that are just fouled out now the whole crowd waves at you. So sometimes it's just better to be quiet, Hello. do your job, go about your business, win the game, smile, pat people on the back, and just go on to the next game. I'm not sure that's the way it works at LSU. No. No. I agree. Kim Kim Mulkey's a character. I'll say that. You, you never know what, uh, what, what she's going to be coming with, especially with what she's wearing. But, I mean, it feels like she's Whoa. arguing after every single call. Did she not go fairly conservative last night? She did, she but the game before, Masters she Green. did not. Yeah. I don't know so, what she was wearing. Um, the game. So, do we have any idea, any kind of rating numbers on that game? I'm not sure yet, but I would think it, it, was, a, it was a really good rating. Um you know, especially because, like I said, last year after last season, you had you probably had even more people tune into it. But I'm sure yeah. it'll be out here in a couple of days. I would think it'd be pretty close to one of the regional, you know, regional final type. You know, especially really maybe curious. one of the lower end. Yeah. Uh, um, also today mentioned Titans cornerback Legarius Sneed talking to the media for the first time in Nashville today, and he said, "There's there's nothing wrong with my knees." Obviously, there's a lot of speculation about 
you know, his um, his injury and, and he did basically dismissed any injury concerns uh, to the media today. He said, there's nothing wrong with my knees. I had a couple of problems, a banged up knee before, but I'm good right now. He played most of, you know, the regular season healthy last year. So I'm not sure why there was too much of a concern anyway to begin with, but now you get it, you know, out of, right out of the horse's mouth and there's nothing wrong with my knees. Kelly, to me, he was one of the three or four most important pieces of their defense. And I'm surprised uh, that they didn't find a way to work it out. Good for the Titans, uh, because this is a huge signing for them. Well, everybody, Kansas City is known for their offense. We all know that. And their first Super Bowl, I've said this a lot. The first Super Bowl, their defense was okay, but last year they they could rely on their defense. So when you've got an offense that is potent as they've had, and now you bring a defense that's just as good, that's a recipe for a lot of winning right there. And their DBs were not good, but last year they were really good. They could cover people. You could go man up with those guys, and he's a big get uh, for the Tennessee Titans. And that's what you have when you got a lot of cap room. Sure. I'm sure the Kansas City Chiefs tried to keep him, but like everybody nowadays, I mean, he's already won a Super Bowl. I don't know if he's won it. He might have won another one with those guys. But, uh, you know, now, now you've already won a Super Bowl. Now, if you're going to get paid by somebody, go get paid. If, if your sport is in the salary cap and your team does consistent winning, at some point it's virtually impossible not to lose important pieces. That's what the salary cap is all about. Yep. Yeah, now we need it in a college game, uh, if if that'll ever happen. I, I kind of doubt it, though. Crazy. Also tonight in the NHL, the Preds hosting the Boston Bruins. Bruins are – is this a pick em, George? I'm looking at this. It is. Right it's, now. Um, okay. Which – which I'm surprised Boston isn't favored. They're the best team in the league, I think, uh, based on points. Whether they are or not, they're right there. A year ago, yeah. they set an NHL record. I think it was 65 wins in the regular season. Nobody had ever done that before. Um, Predators will have their hands full. The good news is that they have been um, getting a lot of help. Did I see? Did St. Louis lose last night? Uh, let me check. I know they've, they've been losing. They were playing. George, where, George, where, where are the predators now in the standings? Are they still seventh? Uh, they're seventh. And to be honest, um, Kelly, that they're in a position where they may not have a lot of pressure down the stretch. Um, whether it's seven or eight, um, the, the pressure as far as um, – let me take a look here. Um, the, the, the pressure, you know, it's now down to they're going to play Dallas, Vancouver, or um, Colorado. And, you know, I'd thought all along that Vancouver was not the team they wanted to play. I think Vancouver is the team they're going to play. And oh, wow. it feels like a better option than either Colorado or Dallas, who are both red really? hot right now. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the Preds. The Preds have the seven spot right now. They've got ninety points. The Kings have the eight spot with eighty-seven points. The Blues are still pretty far behind. They lost last night in overtime at in home overtime. to Edmonton. So they got a point, um, but they need more like six points. Yeah, they're still you know, five points behind at 82 points. So they're going to have to get going here quick because we've got about, what, George, a week and a half yeah, left it, this season? It, uh, eight games left for the Preds in the regular season. Kelly, they likely can clinch a playoff spot in probably the next four days, four games. Really? Yeah. Yeah, oh, that's wow. what that streak did for them was it, you know, St. Louis, St. Louis had a devastating loss a couple of nights ago to San Jose at home, which mm -hmm. had everybody going, are you kidding me? Yeah. San Jose is the worst team in the league, and they shut out St. Louis. 
It's almost like St. Louis threw up the white flag, uh, even though they didn't. But it kind of feels that way. Well, and it feels like the Preds could easily be in the in the blue spot right now too, without that streak. Say that was a oh, absolutely. You know, say without that was a four. Streak. Say that was a four or five game winning streak. You know, the Preds would be where the Blues are probably right now. I mean, that streak yeah. was the season. Yeah, it's what's going to get them in the playoffs. Uh, now the question is, can they get a matchup in the opening round that they can take advantage of? And what that really, not that it comes down to this necessarily, but can you win one of the first two games on the road? If you can, then it gets really interesting. Yeah. So Boston tonight at home, and then St. Louis comes to town Thursday. That that could put the Blues out of their misery if the Preds want that, to do they it. Could, they could bury St. Louis. Yeah. That's what we got. Okay. So after the break, Tony Basilio is going to join us from Knoxville, and my guess is their weather up there is just as dicey as ours is here. Um, nothing new to report other than um, – we have a tor- we're under a tornado watch in Davidson County. Um, wow, they're showing right now a tornado uh, up in Georgetown, Indiana. Wow, um, hmm. that boy, that is some shot. Anyway, we'll be back to talk a little bit of Tennessee basketball, a little bit of everything with Tony. We'll see where we go with it right after this. It was the most horrible experience that any mother could ever go through. I knew that I needed to get help. My friend, she immediately said, you need to call Bart Durham. And you guys were there within an hour. You guys are like family for us. Yeah, sure is nice to connect with the people that you're doing your best to help. As the trusted premier custom home builder in Middle Tennessee, Donnelly Timmons has over 20 years of experience in the industry. Whether you're looking to build your dream home or renovate your current home, their team will ensure that every client in every remodel is unique, luxurious, and completed on time within budget. Founders Dustin Timmons and Joey Donnelly have over 25 years of construction experience in the Nashville area. Together, they have completed projects in Forest Hills, Oak Hill, Green Hills, Franklin, and Brentwood. Dustin and Joey believe that communication is the most important aspect of all construction projects. Therefore, they personally manage each project themselves and are involved in job site activities on a daily basis. Their commitment to quality and integrity has earned them an outstanding reputation among their clients. Contact them to set an appointment for a free consultation or to view some of their completed projects. Give them a call at 615-456-7983 or log on to DonleyTimmons.com. I'm Watson Brown. I'm Kelly Holcomb. I'm Billy Derrick. We're the George Plaster Show. We've been Nashville's best sports talk for the last 30 years. And you know what? We still are. Catch us live weekdays from 2 to 4 p.m. Central Time in Nashville on YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook. Also, the podcast version is available on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Looking for more than just awards and trophies? Southern Trophy House is your one-stop solution. For over 60 years, their team has created lasting impressions with a personalized touch. From embroidery to screen-printed apparel to corporate awards, signs, and name badges, they have everything you need to keep your brand shining bright. With their knowledgeable customer service team, you can relax as they create, produce, pack, and ship merchandise and awards on time and on budget. That includes etched crystal awards, custom cut acrylic, name badges, embroidered Richardson ball caps, banners, screen printed t-shirts, 
laser engraved Yeti cups and knives. Recognize your hardworking team from Southern Trophy House, where they do their best to help you recognize your best. Located at 2705 Nolensville Pike in Nashville, give them a holler, 615-256-7295. Visit southerntrophy.com, Southern Trophy House, for all your personalization and recognition needs. Okay, we are back. Billy, you're going to have to guide me a little bit. Is Tony with us? So Tony is not with us yet. I'm working on getting him in here. He said he has to join by phone. Okay. Uh, but when we do the show from home, that's a little bit harder. So I'll, I'll keep you updated. Okay, got you. Um, so we are at the moment, for what it's worth, if you're watching us live, we're under a tornado watch until oh, 3 I think o'clock. He's- I think he's with us now, actually, George. Okay, let's let's head to Knoxville and say hello to Tony Basilio. Tony, we're all oh nice. I didn't I didn't know you were coming on uh, uh, that way. So, yeah, Tony, my apologies. <laughs> Tony, right off the bat, I want to make sure you see this. Wow, that's beautiful, man. Uh, we're man caving it, Georgie. You're man caving it today. Yeah, we didn't we. Uh, a little worried about the weather. So what are they saying up there? Uh, it's missing us. Really? Yeah, I've got a daughter that's hunkered down uh, near you right now. And yeah. um, my son and my wife are so, so concerned. They're, they just left to go play golf. <laughs> uh, they're, they're really, they're really tore up over this. Cal- well, I can, I can, I can tell they are. Yeah. Um, were they playing golf Sunday? Um, no, but they wish they were. Yeah. So what's been the reaction up there to the loss to Purdue? One of the weirdest reactions to a loss I can remember. Um, a lot of sadness here and not a lot of anger or outrage with Rick Barnes because truly there really wasn't anything Tennessee could have done Sunday differently than what they did. They they shot the ball close to 50% from three-point land. The other team shot it at 20%. The difference in the game is um, the guy on Twitter, somebody called Fal Ming, which I think is a great nickname for that guy. He just fouls everybody. I mean, he just – he fouls so much, George, that they can't call fouls on him. It's um, and look, he gets beat on, you know, um, that that kid, Zach Eady, is a real force at the collegiate level. And I just don't know what Rick Barnes could have done. I, mean, I just don't know what he could have done. But yeah, it, you know, it, it's funny you say it that way, because while I was watching it, I was like, there's really not a lot they can do here. Purdue, in my mind, is probably the second best team in the country if you had right. UConn at number one. Yeah. And they got a lot of talent and they, they've got a kid inside. Maybe the UConn center will have some success with him. But if you're not seven feet tall or taller, I don't know how you defend him. And I don't know how officials officiate with a 7-4 kid. That's not easy. Well, the problem is it's a, he's very clumsy, so he's always throwing his arms and that sort of thing, and they don't call it. And so and that was Rick Barnes's point with the officials. I thought Rick Barnes was a lot more classy in defeat than I would have been. I don't know if you guys caught this, but Zach Eady yelled the F word onto a live microphone on CBS because apparently he was really offended that Rick Barnes is one of the coaches that, in his words, looked over him uh, in recruiting. 
So the story goes, he came, he was at IMG Academy. They came to Catholic High School in West Knoxville and played a couple of games. Um, and Tennessee went in there and scouted, you know, who was there. Uh, Kennedy Chandler was one of the guys that was there. Um, but he wasn't even the starting center on IMG's team that day. It was a guy that ended up playing at Duke, who wasn't very good at Duke, who's now on the end of a bench somewhere in the NBA because he played at Duke, which is kind of how it works, uh, the political stuff in the NBA. But don't get me started on that. At any rate, Edie comes after the game, starts ripping Rick Barnes. I mean, people are just it's really strange. The guy played 40 minutes. He played 39 minutes and a couple seconds. He took him out for like 20 seconds. Played 40 minutes, George, and he committed one foul. I mean, one foul? One? Yeah. you going to tell me that in a physical game like that where, and look, Tennessee was, was fouling him. You have to foul him. You got to move him. But he got... And I'm not an official bitcher. I don't do that stuff. Like, after games, the best team wins. Like, to me, Purdue, with him on the floor, has a better team in Tennessee. But the sad thing for the Vols is they're the third best team in college basketball right now. They just have to be placed in that team's region. You and yep. I were on here three weeks ago, and Kelly asked an astute question regarding what's Tennessee have to do to lock down a number one seed. And the answer was go to the SEC tournament and win a game or two. And of course they went and lost to Mississippi state. And as it turns out, that was extremely costly. Yes. Mm -hmm. Extremely costly because yeah. then you get placed in this dude's region and, and you know, they, they dubbed him Fal Ming on Twitter on Sunday, and I think that's an accurate <laughs> – I mean, the guy's a wild man. The guy is a – the guy just fouls and pushes and shoves and walks, and they really don't know how to officiate him. And it's almost like somebody brought up today, it's the reverse Shaquille O'Neal effect. You know, when we were kids and Shaquille O'Neal was coming along, Shaquille O'Neal um, got beat on in college. This guy is like the snail darter. They treat this guy like an endangered species, like he's a spotted owl or something. It's the weirdest <laughs> thing in the world. Tony, years ago, I learned a good lesson about trying to evaluate big kids. He's one of my best friends in the world, Will Purdue. Yeah. And the truth of it is, as a freshman at Vandy, Will Purdue sucked. Mm -hmm. Couldn't dunk. Uh, he really couldn't do a lot of anything. And they made the decision to redshirt him. And they, with Will, it became more of a individual workouts, uh, mostly with the legendary Tennessee State coach, uh, Ed Martin, who ended up on CM staff. That's wild. And I'll never forget, I started hearing things, uh, you know, I – it's hard to go to somebody that's a friend and go, Hey, how much better have you gotten? But I started hearing stuff that Will Purdue was turning a big corner. So the first time we see him is during Thanksgiving. This is two years later. And I'm the play by play announcer because the football team is playing Tennessee in Knoxville. Well, Will absolutely tears up a great center from Missouri, uh, Gary Leonard. And I'm like, oh, my God, I have never seen a player improve that much in two years. The big guys take longer. There's a lot more variables. I think they are a really difficult thing to judge in recruiting. No doubt about it. We went back and looked just for the heck of it. Zach Eady's offer list, and it was, uh, it was, um, it was very random. It was Purdue, it was Baylor, and it was Western Kentucky, and that's it. Wow! So it isn't like, and he was ranked as like the eighty-something center in his class, like. 
and he was at IMG Academy. I mean, and look, let's face it. IMG Academy is a, you know, it's a high level feeder deal. Generally, you don't get there unless you're pretty good. Um, but to your point, Tennessee's got a big guy on their team right now uh, in JPS Sharla, who played a bunch in that game. And he he's played a, pretty well. He's, that and he played well. Hard. Yeah, he's a, he's a baby giraffe right now, which is kind of what those guys are. You know, the, the young ones, they love him. Barnes thinks he's going to be an NBA player. And it's going to be as good as any center he's ever coached. And he's got several guys. That, well, he's got a couple guys. P.J. Tucker, one of them. They're still playing in the league. So, um, Barnes loves this Estrella guy. The sad thing for Tennessee is they went against the one team in retrospect. They were never beating that team. And, and I liken it to that women's game last night that I guarantee you drew a huge number because this Caitlin Clark is like a freak, you know. Um. I'm watching that game last night, and I don't watch a lot of women's basketball, but I, I watch that stuff when it's, you know, something to see or it looks like you could have a fight or whatever it is, you know. But I watch Caitlin Clark's games because she's just excellent. And she's out there last night. She's so good in the first five minutes that those LSU kids that are usually pretty yappy and pretty talky, they didn't say a word because they knew tonight we're on the floor with Wayne Gretzky. She's got her A game. We're going to try and stay in this thing, but we're probably going to go home. And it really going to matter what we do. And that's kind of what happened to Tennessee Sunday. Tennessee got on the floor with a guy who's literally allowed to do whatever he wants to do. He can camp in the lane. Um, you know, he missed. There are so many potential like igloo coolers, uh, camping world, camp-a-rama, um, so many outdoor sports places, so many potential NIL deals for him. George, when is the last time in a, in a college basketball game you've seen a three-second call? You're it a play-by-play -play uh, guy. When's the last time you saw was, a call? Yeah, it was the Willard Fillmore administration. Thank you. I mean, it doesn't you're happen, does it? Does it happen anymore? No, I, I, you're, I, I was thinking that I saw one three-second call in the entire tournament. Kelly? I know you're in the on deck circle. Fire away. That's my guy. Right I don't there. even know where I, I don't even know where I want to go because you've got me laughing so much right now that I can't even think about what I'm going to do. But but let, let me let's let's go this way. Yeah, it seemed like, and you're absolutely right. That's how big that number one seed was to Tennessee, and I don't think people really realize it until after the fact. Like it was yeah. huge, and you got put into a situation where. You just – like, it's it's a hard matchup against Tennessee. You have a walker trying. Jonas Adu, he was so – you know, he was so, so inefficient bad. at doing it. He was so bad. So and Rick Barnes said, you got to go. They put Estrella wow. in. But, like, a walker I, – I just looked at him. Like, when you're 320, Tony, when you he, – he's 7'4", 320. And I'm sure a walker – he's a big kid. But, like, what does he weigh, 250, 260? Like, you don't even have to do anything if you're 320 pounds, and they're using so much energy on you. So it was just a bad matchup for UT. Horrendous. And and when, when Jonas Adu doesn't come to play, in a perfect world, <sighs> Adu pulls that guy out and shoots the ball over him a few times right. and just kind of forces him, you know, to be honest, you know. Adu, yeah. that poor guy, and he gets in games. And Barnes got this deal down the stretch with Adu where – they kind of figured out, hey, what we get in the first five minutes from you is what we're going to get. So, like, if you're a head coach and you 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 take the football analogy, I'm going to give you a series and a half, okay? And and if you're bad for a series and a half, guess what? You're going to be pretty bad for the whole game. That's kind of the, what they arrived at, whether that's fair or not what they do, but that's the conclusions that they arrived at. So, Kelly, the crazy thing is, Adu goes out there, first offensive possession, shoots like a mid-range shot, and literally leaves it like four feet short of the basket. And you're going, yeah. get him off the floor. I mean, it's yeah. a shame, but, you know, some people get in the moment and they want to compete so hard that it's almost too hard. Like that Awaka guy committed five fouls in 13 minutes, okay? <laughs> that guy wants to be out there so badly, he doesn't take any plays off. The Adu guy, if you would have left him in that game, 
would have been over there behind the photographers on half the possessions. <laughs> I mean, you wouldn't even have seen him. He didn't want to be anywhere near. You know that old uh, uh, that old uh, song, not ready for the 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 old um, Beyonce. I don't think you're ready. I don't think you know that whole. That was him. I mean, what are we doing? Like, come on, Chief. We're trying to get to a Final Four here, and you That's compete all season to get there, and then you shrink in the mo. I mean, I can only imagine what Rick Barnes was thinking because uh, I was sitting here watching the game and Jonas Adu. He had took like three or four shots and he didn't even come close. And I'm like. Please get this guy out of the yeah. game. And that's the Please thing about get him Barnes. Out of the game. And that's the thing about Barnes. Like, usually after games, okay, we have people we call the Barnstormers in our fan base. And these are the people that always pick at him, pick on him, pick on him for his record. Um, I mean, look, Rick Barnes in March, he's not great. He's not. But he was really, he did a, he had a really nice tournament. Like, he did everything they could have done. Yeah. And, you know, seeding is so important to him in particular because the number is the numbers are real stark. When he's a lower seeded team, in other words, a two taken on a one, a four taken on a three, a five taken on a four. In his career, he's because he has such a high floor. He's only been a, a, a lower seeded team 13 times in like a 40 year career and multiple wow. times in the NCAA tournament, but he's got one win now and 12 losses. Uh. And, and that's why they needed to be a one seed. If they were going to get to a final four, the one time that he was a one seed, his Texas team got to a final four this time around. If they would have been a one seed, they would have come out of that region that either Duke or Clemson came out of, and they would have come out of the West. And then it would have been three of the best teams in the country. It would have been them, Purdue, and uh, and uh, the, the guys at UConn. UConn. Who, by the way, nobody's beating. UConn, no. to me, guys, they remind me of that UNLV He's team that went under freeze that one year. Hold on, uh, Billy. Yeah. Is that you bringing Daniel Breezy to the no, show? No, that's me. No. That's me. Oh, my that's God. Me. What is this, Jimmy? If I know that. Hold on, let's bring Billy up. Billy, if you or I did that, all hell would break loose. And you it's I didn't happened twice. You. Hey, two I know you heard it. You heard. It's happened twice to him. I have <laughs> yeah, it has. It has. Yeah, I agree. I can't. Phone? I can't help it. I got my. I got my iPad in here, man. I can't help it. What, what do you want me to do? I mean, I got Third. my iPad closed. It's Daniel Breezy's still coming on. Send her. I turn my volume down, down, Billy. Y'all just relax, yes. Francis. Okay. Billy, you sit and let mommy go make you some more warm milk. And George, you, you just go away Billy for a while. Alone. Hey, you leave Billy alone. He he hasn't interrupted <laughs> my train of thought twice. You yeah, Billy, I've got a good I've got a good word for Billy that I can't say on the podcast, and I won't say it. It's a good description of him where he is right now. But <laughs> well, let's, I've got let's a move on. I've I'm got sure he got one of you too. <laughs> I've got a great descriptor of Billy. Tell me, genius. Oh, <laughs> you guys don't realize it. Billy's so, the best here player. You go. Billy's hey, the best player now. Hey, so so let, let's talk about just one more thing on UT. Uh, we, we talked about it. And the stars came out. Zach Eady scored 40. You know, Dalton Connect scored 37. Mm -hmm. And some I, I thought, you know, he, he needed somebody else, though. And I thought J Josiah Jordan James is going to be that guy. He hit some shots early in the game, and I'm like, there's the guy that's going to help him. Zakai Ziegler was kind of off. I mean, it felt like the whole year that that's what was going to happen. Like, this dude was lights out, but he had to have some – like, Zach Eady can kind of do it himself. But Dalton Connect can – he did a lot of it by himself. But when you get in a game like that, he had to have somebody else. And nobody kind of – it seemed like nobody really stepped up. You know, I just think both teams' supporting casts weren't great and Purdue's was a little bit better. Yeah. would be the way I would phrase that. And – Tennessee had a deal happen, and you you can't blame. And that, everything about this game is, I'm convinced, guys, they play that game ten times. I keep it real, okay? Tennessee probably wins one and a half of them. About fifteen percent chance of winning that game. Yeah, that's all. I mean, look, <laughs> basketball is a game of matchups. When you have a big guy, and you got to rely on a freshman 
a true freshman in that spot, like you said, against a 400-pound guy. I mean, here's the thing with Zach Eady. I got news for him. He's not playing in the NBA. He's not. But he certainly could be a professional wrestler. And I'm being serious about that. He, he First of all, he's got a great heel look to him. He's kind of unlikable. <laughs> um, he would be great in that arena. I'm not kidding. I, I, I You guys think I'm kidding. I am not kidding. It's, hey, he's that's got, funny. Like, natural heel energy about him. He just does. I mean, look at that guy. I can't stand that guy. No offense to him. He's a young kid, Tony. Give him a break. He's he a heel, 40, though. You're right. He played hey, 40 you're, minutes and committed one <laughs> foul. He's fouled out of one game in his life. He's okay. not he don't a have, young kid. He, he don't have to jump. He don't have to do anything, Tony. He, he doesn't have to do anything. He doesn't have to a foul menace. You. He's a menace to basketball <laughs> society, and I can't wait till he's out of college basketball. He's marred but it. He's also in better shape than any big man we've ever seen on the college level. No to doubt. be able to play as many minutes as he did, yeah. that is to his credit. Well, George, I mean, just in travels alone, he walked two and a half miles the other day. I mean, just in <laughs> travels. I mean, the guy's in incredible shape. What's wrong with you, Tony? Hey, so, so you don't – so – George, I'm going to present this question to you. And this was George's question the other day, but Dalton Connect, he's going to be a pretty good pro. Yeah. So you don't think much of you don't think much of Zach Eady being a pro? No, at not all. Not at that level. No. Do you really not? Unless somebody wants to turn the clock back, the problem with him is, what are you going to do with him at that level? Those guys are so quick. Yeah. Joel Embiid shoots the ball. Joel Embiid seven four runs like a gazelle and shoots the ball from 25, 26 feet. That's who those. That's who. That's what, what a professional center is now. Unless you can guard those guys in space, you're not going to be able to sit under a rim. I mean, it's just the game doesn't work that way now. You know, Kerry uh, Keating had a very similar answer yesterday yeah. when I asked him. I said, "Look, there's no doubt about Dalton Connect as a pro. He's right. going to be a stud yeah. for somebody. Yeah. Uh, Zach Eady. You know, I, I don't know. I mean." It seems like you'll have some big sumo wrestling thing between Agreed. him and Rudy Gobert. Yeah. But there are a bunch of centers that can go out and are way quicker. So how do you hide that? And I that's the problem. Yeah. And Gobert, George, is a much, much better athlete than him. I mean, the guy can't move. And that's why he doesn't move. And in the at the NBA level, they're not going to let you camp in the lane for seven seconds to get the ball. They're just not. I mean, they're going to officiate the game differently. The collegiate game, and I'm not, look, our fan base after the game was saying, well, he stinks. He's it. No, he doesn't. No. At the collegiate level, he's incredible. He's dominant. He's got soft hands. He catches the ball very well. I mean, he's... He is a real force at the collegiate level, and he's and he's unofficiatable, which is even, you know, which is even more dangerous. At the pro level, I mean, he's he's back to the future. I mean, he's got no, you know, if it's the nineteen eighties, yeah, man, he's first pick in the draft. But man, the game has evolved at that pro the level. Game Those guys changed. are incredible, yeah. and you know, you know that. You watch them live. You watch that pro game live. And man, those big seven four guys, seven two, they're doing things that just don't seem like you should be able to do. The real lesson to me was when yeah. Patrick Ewing realized that he was going to have to take his game out fifteen to seventeen feet when he was with the Knicks, and I was like, my God, he he never got challenged that way in college, but he right. knew fairly quick in the NBA. I'm going to have to take it way out farther. And maybe I'm wrong. I don't see Edie having that skill. Mm -mm. He hadn't shown it. I mean, I guess. Not yet. I guess he could develop that. My problem with him is I just don't see a guy that can move. I don't know if you guys have seen this, but DJ Burns, who they've dubbed the dancing bear over there at NC State, a guy who started at Tennessee. Tennessee um, signed him when he was 17 years old and reclassified him and got him here. And he was really immature. He was really heavy. Um, they took his car from him when he got to campus, made him walk everywhere. 
he lost 72 pounds here pretty quickly. Wow. He got, he, he got into shape, but he wouldn't come. He wouldn't come to practice like on time. He was just not, he was never going to fly right and play for Rick Barnes. He just wasn't. Right. So they, they moved him on because they needed space in a class. They moved him on and he ended up over at the small college in South Carolina where he played Winthrop. for a couple of years, Winthrop, and now he's Winthrop. at NC state. Well, uh, uh, one of the guys from the NFL put a tweet out and said that there are NFL teams inquiring about making an offensive lineman out of him potentially because of his feet, a yeah. big man with feet like that, that kid's really nimble for how big he is. Now, if he got, if he lost weight, it would not surprise me if he played in the NBA, George. That's a guy right there. Oh, I listen with NBA skill and NBA feet. Now that guy's scary. Yeah, he's got incredible dot drop step kind of yeah. stuff. Now he's not going to get that shot that he gets in college, mm -mm. From four feet and in. Mm -mm. Um, so you know he's going to have to take it considerably out. Um, but man, he is fun to watch. Oh, he's so fun. Him and Edie uh, Saturday will be a real battle if they officiate that thing properly. But what's going to happen is one guy's going to have 3,000 uh, yes. about 11 and a half minutes into the game, and one guy's going to have none. And they're both going to be doing the same things on defense. <laughs> they are, Kelly. There's, they are. There's a real shot of that. Yeah. they Kelly, the Edie guy is pushing and shoving. Friday night in their in their game uh, against Gonzaga, he karate chopped a guy from behind, literally like uh, WCW Ivan uh, or um, one of the Koloffs with the with the Russian sickle from behind, and they called no foul oh. on him. He just knocked him out of the floor. Whoosh. I thought you were about to take him to Lago in uh, Rocky. <laughs> yeah, I was. I was trying in my. I couldn't remember Winthrop. Hey, Kelly hey, bailed me out on Winthrop. So, so Tony, you, you tell me, you tell last one. I'm sorry, George, but you told me the other day yeah. Kelly Harper was safe, man. Oh, I didn't think they'd mess with her. I didn't think they'd wow. mess with her. I'll tell you what happened. So, athletic director Danny White went around. This is what athletic directors do now. Okay, they would never admit this. This is what they do, though. This is a part of the job now. He went around and was polling some of the boosters for the women's basketball program. And he said, would you pony up some money to help her in recruiting? And the answer he got was no, 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 oh, wow. and no. And when that occurs at that level, it's goodbye. So yeah. they waited till April the 1st, till her contract, uh, till, till the buyout, was a million dollars less and they gave her the news on april the fools or april fool's day april 1st and you know it's a sad thing for her because she's a very class person who represented this place with a lot of class and a lot of grace and a buddy of mine called my show yesterday who was really tore up because he goes to church with her you know people forget these are real people and the husband and the her children and the whole deal. And he was like, man, they're just really sweet people. And the thing that got her at the end of the day is they weren't, they were not only, not only were they not getting elite players, they weren't even getting involved with elite players. And when you're at a place like this in that sport, you know, you should be recruiting right up there with the best if yeah. you're doing it right. And so the, the question now becomes, what does Tennessee do from here? I tell you what's interesting Jeff Walls is a guy from Louisville who's a highly accomplished coach who lost one of his best players last year in the NIL market, which was frustrating to him, to LSU, uh, the guard that was down there, Haley Van Lith. The thing, yeah. the thing that you could see is somebody like him get involved with this job. The problem is I don't know that politically that they want to hire a man here for that thing. And I'm look, I just keep it real. I said that today on my daily show. I'm a keep it real person. And if Danny White does that, if the administration does that, they'll be crossing, they'll be kind of crossing a threshold. It'll be interesting to see how it goes, because I think when it comes to the Pat Summit uh, coaching tree family, they're about out of options right now. Yeah.
Yeah, that, that's exactly where it is. They're about out of options. Yeah. Okay. Tell people how they can hear you. And are there any post game shows left? <laughs> um, Club is where you can hear us. And my blog's up every day. We have a couple thousand words. We're pretty prolific. A couple thousand words up every day, myself, contributors. And and then every day, tclub.team um, is where you can hear what we do. The We will do some post-game stuff. Like after the Vanderbilt games, we'll be doing some post-game stuff. Um, after some of the big baseball games and then into the baseball postseason, we'll be doing some things. Tennessee's baseball team is wild, guys, because they just don't have arms right now, which is a weird thing for uh, Tony Vitello to see how everybody else has been living all these years. And one thing about that sport, when you don't have arms or you get a couple injuries like they have at this level, there's nowhere to run and nowhere to hide. And, Billy, I'll tell you what, man, that Georgia team, those guys get mm. off the bus swinging that bat. You wait, you guys wait till you see them. They swing the – I mean, you better bring it when you're on the mound against those dudes. They run-rolled yeah. Tennessee the other night. Run-rolled them in the Friday night game. By the way, Friday night, guys, we were on here till 3 a.m. local time. Oh, my God. And then we turned around. And then the next night, George, I played a gig and didn't get home till 1 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> and then uh, Easter Sunday, we were on the air for four hours. Mm. And I don't think I look too bad. You're not. Everything I've been through. You're I mean, completely too bad. Not. Too bad. It's all relative. Too right. bad. That's debatable. It's why we both uh, made it with careers in radio. <laughs> no doubt about it. People people meet me and they go, you're right. You do have a face for radio. And yeah. you do look like a Muppet. That's two things people say to me. <laughs> We're out of here. <laughs> See you guys. See you next week. See ya. He is a piece of work. Oh, my God. I thought, thought about that, though, George, when you think about the UT coaching search for women. I mean, yeah. like, I don't think they're going to go out of bounds. Like, it's always been a woman. Right. Um, he might want to float a trial balloon on that one. Uh, yeah. Tony's right. It, it would break some new ground. Okay. Very similar. After very similar, though, George, uh, situation with the Stackhouse thing. I, I I don't know this to be totally true, but you got to imagine when they go to donors for NIL and they don't want to support that coach, that's happening more and more, I feel like. Yeah, and but what's coming is going to be the, oh, we're, you're asking us every year? Forget it. Yeah. So There's going to be some donor fatigue that's going to hit mm -hmm. – and hit fairly soon. Yep. After the break, we'll have stat of the day. Uh, the odds are stacked against us getting it right. And then I'm going to toss – Taylor Barnett was supposed to come on with us and had to uh, bail. I'm going to throw a couple of numbers out at you that I think might be uh, of some interest in the world of college basketball. So stick around. We have plenty more coming. Hit After Hit has become the baseball store in Tennessee. They have over 1,000 different models of gloves and over 1,500 wood bats. They also have several iron mic pitching machines as well as a hit tracks machine. If they don't have it, you probably don't need it. We're proud to call Hit After Hit the official shirt provider of the Plaster and Friends Celebrity Bowling Night. Forget the fact that Sir Speedy Music City is owned by my BGA classmate James Warren. Their work stands on its own merit. James and his staff do incredible work, as evidenced by the huge banners at the Plaster and Friends Celebrity Bowling Night. If you're looking for quality to help your marketing and business communications and you want it at a reasonable price, these are your folks. Call them at 615-832-9511 or go to print at sirspeedymusiccity.com. 
and be sure to tell them Plaz sent you. Over the years, more men have started to seek help for hormone deficiencies and imbalances. And Dr. Jeffrey Lodge and wife Daphne, along with their experienced staff, give men the treatment required to improve their quality of life, improve your immune system, energy level, cognitive function, and more. There's no better time to achieve a healthy lifestyle. What are you waiting for? Give Cool Springs MD a call today for an appointment at 615 615- 486-3458 or visit the website coolspringsmd.com For over 35 years Wilson Bank and Trust has been committed to providing customized banking solutions to help individuals, families and businesses in Tennessee achieve their goals. As your full service community bank, we are proud to offer loans with competitive rates, local decision making, and fast, friendly service from our experienced lenders. No matter where you are on your financial journey, Wilson Bank and Trust is ready to help you take the next step. Visit your nearest Wilson Bank and Trust office or online at wilsonbank.com to get started today. Member FDIC, equal housing lender. Convenience and value, two words that we expect when we do business. Our goal at JHA Company is to deliver just that, both to our school partners and to our customers. Whether you're purchasing photos, yearbooks, class jewelry, letter jackets, school spirit wear, or senior graduation products, we strive to make the experience easy, convenient, and cost-effective. Find out more at jhacompany.com or call 615-867-6345 for more information. JHA, one source, one company. Top of the hour on a Tuesday. We'll be talking a little college basketball coming up. But first, stat of the day brought to you by John English Antique Sports and Cards out in Shelbyville. All right. Let's see what we got today. I think we're going baseball again. Here we go. Mets fans are livid after the team fell to 0-4 following a collapse to the Tigers in the 10th inning last night. When was the last time the Mets started a season 0-4? How the hell would anybody know that? <laughs> uh, I happened to catch I happened to catch the 10th inning of that game last night. And the relief pitcher uh, is a former Brave, Michael Tonkin. And uh, so Tonkin comes into a scoreless game and proceeds to give up five, which if you hit your SAP button is Cinco. Either way, the people at City Field booed the daylights out of them. So they're 0-4. Uh, there's no reason for this team to be 0-4, and, and the people up there are pissed off. Um, I have not even the foggiest clue when the last time they started, yeah, I, Willie would because Willie would for sure he dies with them. Um, Let's phone a friend, phone Willie. Yeah, I'm just trying to think um, if there's an obvious answer. I don't really have one. Billy, put it up All there. Right. 2005. Great. Five mm. straight losses. Who is that? Is that Pedro? Is that uh, what's his name? Last name Pedro Martinez. That's Pedro yeah. Martinez, um, as a Met. Forgot he was a Met. Right. Yeah. Um, that was not one of their better deals. And the Mets have to be up there with the Jets and most cursed organizations in sports. Yep, and I'm not overly bothered by it. <laughs> You're not a Mets so, fan, George? Not really. Uh, we, we used to, if you remember, in the underdog competition, we would use music. And Willie had that stupid meet the Mets, meet the oh, Mets, yeah, yeah. step right up and meet the Mets, bring your kitties, bring your wife, 
um, something about you'll have the time of your life. And I tried to come up one day with some uh, words that would not be as positive. <laughs> I had a hard time. I couldn't come, couldn't come with anything. So I've got numbers for you. All right. Um, I would guess by tomorrow at the latest on Thursday that we'll know some numbers on um, the women's game last night, LSU and Iowa, and and the impact that Caitlin Clark has had. Billy, they played a year ago in the title game, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. That game drew the largest women's crowd. Let, let me let me back that up. The largest TV rating in women's basketball history drew uh, something like a nine point nine share, and um, wow. the the game. A few days ago, the uh, Iowa Colorado game, I think to get Iowa to the Sweet 16, had a number up toward the nines. So she's definitely having an impact. So, what do y'all think is the largest NCAA men's game, TV rating wise, of all time? The teams? Or the just the rating, no, the teams. Ooh, ooh, yeah. I would say that. I would say that. Oh man, I don't even know, man. I, I'm just throwing one out there that Duke and UNL game where, you know, Duke got slaughtered the year before, and then uh, they played them in the final four, and I think they beat them. According to this, it's not in there. Okay. I'm gonna say, gotcha. I'm gonna say Duke. You and are you saying national title or just game NCAA? No, I'm game? saying the the single largest. Um, oh wait a minute, hold on a second, hold on. I got I got to re say this uh, because uh, highest rated televised NCAA basketball national championship games. Mm. Mm. Which I'm guessing, given that they're for the title, although I can't swear to this because I would think that the uh, the the Louisville Houston five slamma jamma semifinal would have been way up there. But anyway, that's what I was that's what I was going to ask. Is it is it is it long ago or is it sometime near? Um. Well, for me, they're right in my wheelhouse. Oh, okay. Yeah. So it is back in the day. Yeah, it is. The, is it eight? Is it should be obvious? Is it eighty three? Number one should be obvious. Billy suddenly learning that uh, these Nin little quiz games aren't as easy <laughs> as you think they are. Nineteen eighty three. Uh, wrong. Who breath? Oh, uh, gosh. 1995. I can't think of that. I'm about to give you the top 10. The first okay. one is obvious. And Billy, you should be ashamed. I'm sure I'm, sure I'm going to be ashamed too. A little bit. Magic versus uh, mm. Larry Bird. Oh, Larry Bird, Indiana State, Larry Michigan Bird. State. Hey. That is, according to to what I'm looking at, the highest rated championship game ever drew a 24.1 share. Now, it's interesting. Yeah. Remember now that there are times where you've got some split coverage where it's not always CBS, like this right. year, TBS. According to this, the second highest watched game ever uh, is the Georgetown Villanova game at Rupp Arena in 85. I was going to say a Georgetown shot. game. I, I wondered which one it was. Villanova shot 79% uh, in the second half to mm. win by two. 
Yeah, yeah. unbelievable performance. I that, remember watching that game, man. That was uh, Billy. That was before you were even here, there, Hoss. Yeah. Awesome. That was a good game. I remember Patrick Ewing and and then Villanova ends up beating them because everybody thought that you know Georgetown was a thing, and they were. I mean, John Thompson and all that, but uh, Villanova, man. Raleigh so, Massimino. Yeah. Duke, Michigan in 92. Uh, okay. His third highest grade. That was Coach K. Was that Coach K's first title? Uh, I don't know. One of the early ones, at least. I don't know. The, uh, the NC State deal with Houston – is the fourth highest watched. And I will bet that late, that that as that game kept staying close, that that audience got a lot higher at the end because Houston was about a 10, 11 point uh, favorite in that game. Yeah. NC State I'll, uh, no chance. I'll say this. If NC State is in it again, say they do it again and they knock off Purdue, I think the ratings will be higher for an NC State UConn national title as opposed to it being Purdue UConn. Would you all agree? Uh, I don't know I, about that. I don't know the because DJ I, Burns effect. Well, I, I'm, look, you may be right, but I know personally, I, I want to see Purdue and UConn. I want to know because Purdue. I think we'll do a better job if if these two teams end up playing each other. Purdue will do a better job of tempo, of yeah. keeping the score down in the 50s and the 60s um, because I think that's what's going to be needed. If you get into a run and gun with UConn, I don't know. I don't know that that's not – what? Don't those guards have to? Yeah, don't those guards have to shoot better for Purdue though, George? Than they did in the UT yes. game. Yeah. Absolutely. If they if they do the Heimlich maneuver, uh, because in the Tennessee game, I got the distinct impression none of them wanted to shoot late. Ooh. Yep. And I think there. that is a really bad sign for Purdue if they get in a title game with UConn, because. Yeah. First of all, this this big kid at UConn, Kleinen, yeah. he may be good enough to go toe to toe with Edie. Now, I don't think he's got the stamina. It seems like they play him about 21, 22 minutes at a time. I'm looking over here at the Weather Channel. They keep showing this poor guy in Covington, Kentucky, which is right on the border. You see the Bengal Stadium, and then you know what you're looking for. You yeah. see the Red Stadium. And you see sunshine, and that's not a good story. No. Um, so, for I, I want to see, I want to see what happens in that game. Kleinen looks like the one guy that may be able Klingen. to go toe to toe. Klingen, Klingen, is that how you say it? Klingen, Klingen, whatever. Daniel, there we go. Oh my gosh. What's Daniel Danielle telling us? What's the update, Danielle Breezy? Tornado watch. Tornado watch for your area. Uh oh, looks shocker. like now until 9 p.m. Uh, this has gotten pushed back all day. It, earlier it was 10 a.m. Then okay, maybe one or two o'clock, then maybe three or four o'clock. This thing keeps getting pushed back. So um, it's good to be a meteorologist. You don't have to be right. <laughs> exactly. Wow. You try doing that and see if it's easy. Oh, here we go. Well, here we go. I mean, George, George, you know, other than being a radio guy, George stayed in his room when he was a kid looking at the ceiling, thinking about the weather. <laughs> I want to be a meteorologist when I grow up. Well, maybe if I don't get into radio, I'm going to be a meteorologist. Kelly, that's for you. <laughs> There's the Titan Stadium. Thank you. Looky there. Looks like we've got a little Atlanta Brave stuff. Shocker. Got a lot of trophies, none of which were won in sports. Um, no, no. Anyway, okay. So the rest of the list, let me let me get this thing back where it needs to be. Um, um I have a scam call, by the way, right now. So let's get rid of that. <laughs> Oh, 
Okay, so um, North Carolina, Michigan, the one where Chris Weber called the timeout, mm. was not there, drew a 22.2 share. It's very interesting. None of the recent games are up there. Uh, game number six, Arkansas Duke in 94. Oh, yeah. Okay. Carolina Georgetown in 82 when um, – Michael Jordan. That was Michael Jordan, right? Right. Jordan hit the shot, but there was the also shot. Georgetown um, had a player who thought he was throwing it to a teammate, and it goes oh, right yeah. – Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Michigan Seton Hall in 89 is number eight. That was a game that went to overtime. That was uh, – I think I'm right that that was Glenn Rice at Michigan who put on an absolute incredible show. John Wooden's last game at UCLA at 75 was against Kentucky. He announced his retirement the day before so that wow. there wasn't a long – deal but that one that's 1975 that drew a 21 share and wow. Louisville Duke in 86 drew a 20.7 so it's interesting there's nothing according to this from 2000 on that's in the top 10 most watched games ever wow it so many, so many other things people can do instead of watching. So it's crazy. Like, yeah, you know, back in the day, you didn't have you didn't have much, so everybody was watching the same stuff. But nowadays, you got so much stuff to choose from. Nobody's nobody's taking interest. I don't guess. I don't know. There's still well, a lot of people that watch it though. Yeah, and the national title is on a Monday night. When was that switch made, George? When were those? When were those '80s and '90s? What day of the week were those on? Oh no, the, the the switch was during John Wooden's tenure at UCLA back in the in the early 70s they made okay. the change. Um, okay. I was wondering because I can remember that, uh, Jacksonville UCLA uh national title game with Artis Gilmore and Pembroke Burroughs, yeah. the first of the the twin towers that we ever saw. That was on a Saturday. You know, it may well be the Kentucky um, UCLA game may have been the first year they moved the final to Monday night. the The yeah. final up until then had been Saturday during the day, which right. is not considered prime ratings yeah. grab. Well, if you look back in the last 10, 15, even 20 years, there, are, there aren't many national titles where you go, man, that was a classic. I mean, Butler Duke, right, with Gordon Hayward missing the half-court shot. I think about that one. But you've had some blowouts. You know, you had Florida go back-to-back. -back. I just, in the 80s and 90s, I'm sure it's a lot easier for y'all to go, I remember that one, I remember this one, I remember that one. For me, in the last decade or so, there aren't many, and I think that kind of tells you – I'm not saying the college game has has weakened or declined, but, I mean, the numbers say it in that in that list, George. I mean – Okay, help me with this, though, Billy. You got a Villanova national title game where a kid hits a three at the buzzer. That's, yeah, that's Carolina. a good one. You never hear that one brought up. Yeah. It's one of the great title games of all time. That was a really and good I game. don't know why. I think because it's Villanova, maybe Villanova is a they're a proud program, but I don't know. There's yeah, something they, about they the blue. Three, they've won three national titles though. Now, I mean, they're they're yeah. kind of a you know now since Jay Wright's gone, they've kind of kind of uh, slid a little bit. He's still there. I mean, he's a really good coach, but they're kind of considered one of the blue bloods. I mean, they are, start are they in that in it, baby. <laughs> <laughs> But are they in that esh top echelon of blue bloods with Kentucky and Kansas and Michigan State? Because I don't, in North well, Carolina, based on that number they are correct. I mean, based yeah. on number of national titles, they are. Yeah, I just wonder because. Go ahead. It just feels like it's those four 
you know, those kind of those four, Kentucky, uh, Kansas, Michigan State, North Carolina. I guess you throw well, UConn in there. I don't, you left Duke out. Or Duke. The, yeah, the Duke question, too. yeah, the question that I asked the other day, though, guys, is with this new landscape of college athletics and with kids being free agents like they are in the National Football League, like the NBA, like Major League Baseball, are you going to be seeing some teams that maybe come along as a – you know, Texas Tech, or are the yeah. Blue Bloods still going to be able to, like George just said, like it's donor fatigue sometimes. When when you go back to the same donor over and over and over and over again, at some point they're going to say, man, I'm done. I've given so much. I'm done. So are you going to see some teams that are not so relevant become relevant, or are you going to see the teams like the Kansas, the Kentuckys, Kentucky's got all kind of money, man. I've been up there. So it's, but you think about Kansas, you think about Duke, North Carolina, will they still in the transfer portal world be up there at that upper echelon because they've got donors willing to pay, pay that money? Well, first of all, this is what I think I know. I don't think this can go on much longer the way it is. For instance, take, Belmont and Lipscomb locally. Yeah. Belmont's lost their three best starters. Um, one of them got a half million dollar deal uh, at Maryland, the, the point guard. Um, yeah. Billy, help me here. Has Cade Tyson um, signed anywhere yet? Agreed. Uh, he it? hasn't. I, he hasn't, but I've heard North Carolina potentially for him. Yeah, and, and he's from that area, and yeah. I think I'm right. He had a brother that played at Clemson. Yeah, yeah. Um, Malik Dia, a lot of rumors that he's going back to Vandy. Yeah. Um, or is that what you're hearing, Billy? Um, yeah, I'm hearing. There's a lot of smoke there, so we'll we'll, we'll see what yeah. happens. So, so what I what I'm getting at is this, Kelly. What what's starting to happen? is that the Belmonts and the Lipscombs and take it wherever you want to um, uh, of the non-Power Fives, they're now being used as minor league feeder systems. Oh, and that's wow. it's just dead-ass wrong what's oh, going wow. on. And somebody has got to get some sense in this thing. And, you know, otherwise – we're not going to have what's been great about college basketball is that these teams have been able to compete at a really high level. And if something doesn't change soon, they're going to ruin a pretty good thing. Well, but what, how do you put the genie back in the bottle though, George? Okay. Like it's already like the NCAA had no plans that's that's what bothers me. There was no organization to it whatsoever. They just said, "Hey, here here we go. You got the NIL. You can give these kids like if they would have come out with some structure and said, "Here's what you can do, and here's here's where you can go, and and set like a salary cap, like Billy talked about." I, I mean, I, I probably feel much better about that. But but now, like if you go back on it, then you're going to get kids that are going to go lawyer up, and they're going to get into the antitrust deal. Right. And then you're going to they're going to sue the NCAA, which we all we've talked about it before. The NCAA always loses, so then that's going to banish the NCAA. I just don't know how you can put the genie back in the bottle, George. They need to. I'm, I'm with you. I think they need to. But how do you do that? Hey, Billy, I need uh, I need you to send Jeff him a link. Um, I got you because he's going to join us after the break. Kelly, there isn't a good answer. It's that old line about when the toothpaste comes out, you ever tried to put it back in? I mean, Thanks. it's, I, I don't know. I know this. Stanky was at a Preds game a week ago and really got booed badly. Did he and really? Frankly, I'm one of them that feels that way about him because he's yeah. shown a level of arrogance toward the little guy and your school's one of them. Belmont, some, you know, this is what's made basketball great is those schools' ability to compete at a high level. And 
uh, to me, Sankey is the poster child of only the chosen 50 matter and the rest of you can go jump in the lake. It just means more. Yes. So I've been told. <laughs> okay. After the break, Jeff Hem will join us. Sounds very talented play by play voice. Um, I think right now their game is still on, but obviously that's very up in the air. If it were to happen tonight, it would be the home opener. We'll talk with Jeff right after this. Star Physical Therapy was established in 1997 with one great mission, to serve. If you're hurting, don't wait to receive physical therapy. You don't need a referral to see their physical therapist, and early morning and evening appointments are available. Make the call to 615-673-1420 and get rid of that pain. Star Physical Therapy, the official health provider of Football Friday. Venture Express has been helping people in this area for more than 40 years. They're headquartered in Murfreesboro with over 30 years of dedicated fleets involving production, manufacturing, and corrugated experiences. They're an asset-based company with over 700 tractors, 4,000 trailers, and 800 drivers. If you need their help, dial them up 615-793-9500 or log on to Venture Express. Com. Yo, you want to see something cool? No. Well, I'm going to do it anyway. Step into the scene. No, nobody can do it like me. Zoo house plate with the kick with Z. I was the black top king. Three six C's in my green machine. I was a kid and I was breaking down doors. You were in a crash. Yeah. Your kids were in the car with you. We're very lucky to even be telling this story to you. Nikki treated us like family and she was very caring and loving and I'm just so grateful for that. She was somebody I could trust and being a veteran, that's so important to me. My kids are going to have a better life now because I don't have to worry about those expenses that we were out. Your family has really created a legacy of trust and I would recommend you to anyone. You know, starting to save for your future doesn't have to be difficult. Let Wilson Bank and Trust help tone up your financial goals this year. Our certificates of deposits or CDs can help your money work harder with our competitive rates, earning you more than ever before. WBT checking options allow you to earn rewards you can really use, like a high interest rate or cash back on check card purchases when you meet some e-banking qualifications. Visit your closest Wilson Bank and Trust office or online at wilsonbank.com to get started today. Member FDIC. We are back. Uh, that each one of us doing the show today from the house because. We just didn't know from a time standpoint earlier today, they were saying a lot of this tornadic possibility would get in here in the two to four o'clock range. Uh, as I look outside, thank goodness, nothing yet. Uh, so I guess let's go to the ballpark. Uh, the Sounds home opener is scheduled tonight. And that guy to the right knows more about it than I do. He is the very talented play-by-play -play voice of the sounds, Jeff Him. Jeff, what do we got? Uh, how are you doing, George? Good to be with you yeah. for another baseball season. Uh, yeah. Is Kelly around? I want to make sure Kelly knows I'm in a booth. It's got walls on each side. I am, man. I was, I was going to ask you that. No, no new paint or anything? <laughs> Actually, they did, actually, there is a fresh coat of paint on the walls in the booth this year. Thank you for nice. asking. Our, our nice. operations team will be glad to know that you inquired, Kelly. What business yeah. is here? <laughs> Good Lord. 
I'm just Make excited. Make the guy go to a game and find out. I know. I know. I had I had to do it because I know he's uh, always so intrigued by it, and I look forward to these booth these booth visits all season long where we can uh, show Kelly what they all look like and how complex nice. they all are to each I'm other. I'm looking forward. Yeah. But you yeah, never but, know what the hell's coming out of his mouth. That's why I look forward to these visits every week. It's great. Uh, but, no, in all seriousness, good to be with you guys. And, yeah, home opener tonight. Um, I, I think it's going to happen. I think we might have to wait a little bit um, from the way things are looking. Right now, it's, you know, the sun is almost coming out. I know we're I know. in between. We're in between, I think, some these periods of rain. Thankfully, what has already fallen today was not severe. It was just traditional rain. Um, you know, the tarp is on the field, and I know there's another wave that's expected to come here in the next little bit. Um, but I think once that passes, we should have a good chance to play this game, um, especially if it means waiting a little bit. We always want our fans to remember a few things in this situation. We're going to make every effort to play. Um, you know, folks have been calling the ballpark since nine this morning asking about tonight's game. We, may, we as a front office make every effort to play these games. Um, there's a lot of work that goes into it from all sorts of angles that make it a lot easier to play the game as it's scheduled, especially when it's your home opener, um, than to have a, a doubleheader somewhere else in the week. So every effort gets made to play the game. I mean, I can count almost on one mm -hmm. hand the amount of times over the years of this current ballpark having a situation where – it got rained out, and it got rained out hours before first pitch. It's just very rare. This this ballpark drains incredibly well. Logistically, you always want to try to get the game in that you're scheduled to have. Um, those two things, plus, I think, later on, a little bit more favorable forecast. Um, give us a good shot. I'm, I'm not guaranteeing anything, but I, as I sit here today, I sit here at this moment looking at the next few hours, I think we've got a good opportunity – to get this game in. So if people are wondering or they've got tickets or they're thinking about it, um, we'd love to have you. And and trust me that for all kinds of reasons, every effort is going to get made um, to play this game tonight. Okay. You want a great minor league baseball weather story? <laughs> of course. This is one of my best. I, I'm, If I remember correctly, I was in college at the time and I was doing Towns games, not as well as you do, I'm I can promise <laughs> But the, the PA announcer was the legendary uh, now Texas Ranger voice, Chuck Morgan, who also was one of the voices of the Grand Ole Opry. And so he had to leave a lot of times around the seventh inning to get back and do his duties Grand Ole Opry wise. And on this particular night, filling in for him was the late Jim Beard, nicknamed Bigfoot. And if you knew... Jim, you'd know why he got the nickname. And so on this particular summer night, you can see a couple of flashes of lightning way out in the distance from Greer. Mm -hmm. And Bigfoot gets on the mic and says, there's nothing to worry about. You know, we checked. Well, 10 minutes later comes the craziest <laughs> electrical storm in history. And the part that was great was the next night, back then, the press box was dominated by Tennessean sports writer Tom Squire, who was a real needler. And all of a sudden, Bigfoot comes walking through that press box, and Tommy goes, well, if it isn't our staff meteorologist, <laughs> Jim Beard, you ever seen the commercial, you know, the Southwest not going anywhere for a while? <laughs> yeah. That's what Bigfoot wanted, because I'm telling you, Tommy Squires <clears throat> posted him. He's like, you tell everybody nothing's coming, and we've got an electrical storm. That's it great. Hilarious. Well, and let me just add, since this is our first conversation in this format for this baseball season, uh, you mentioned the name Chuck Morgan. He was one of the first people I thought of when the final out occurred in last year's World Series. Yes. So many people like Chuck have been with the Rangers for a long, long time. Um, and I saw on social media the other day, he was the first recipient of their ring ceremony. The literal first person to come up and get their ring was Chuck Morgan. It was a pretty good looking ring, I might add. But yeah. uh, 
but good for Chuck to, to get a World Series ring as part of that Rangers staff down there. Yeah, he uh, w- we had him on right afterwards, and he talked about the parade and, you know, being up there. And Chuck has been put in the uh, Texas Ranger Hall of Fame as of a couple of years ago, but his roots uh, go right back to Greer Stadium. So it's not Greer anymore. It's yeah. First Horizon, which is a beautiful park. Tell me about the team we're going to see this summer. Yeah, I'm excited about this team. Uh, you know, look, as long as the parent club is the Brewers, I'm always going to be excited about what we will probably have in Nashville because the Brewers are good at developing and selecting young talent, um, and they use it and need it at the big league level. They're playing their home opener right now in Milwaukee, and their lineup's got Sal Freelich, it's got Bryce Tarag, it's got Jackson Churio, it's got a number of young players who have come through here just in the last couple of years, and there's more coming. Um, there are prospects on this Sounds team right now. There are some more that'll be here over the course of the year. Um, this year's team is a little bit younger group, even of the guys who've been to the big leagues out of our current roster right now, um, not many have a lot of major league time. So to me, that makes for a pretty hungry group, um, especially just, I mean, it's a fact that about 55 to 60 players are probably going to don a Brewers uniform at some point this year. And probably about 55 to 60 guys are going to wear a Sounds jersey at some point. There's so much movement and movement oftentimes means opportunity, whether it's getting from double A AA to AAA or Triple A to the big leagues, or coming in from another organization, um, these big, there's so much movement in the game transaction-wise um, with the volume of games, the schedule, the frequency of injuries. So guys are going to be needed, and if you are a sound, you know you're going to get a very good look to earn your way to the big leagues. It's just a fact from how the Brewers are built right now and how they figure to be built this year they're the reigning nl central champs um you know corbin burns dealt to baltimore brandon woodruff is out for the year so two-thirds of that trio the last few years that's been with freddie peralta is not going to pitch for the brewers this year but they've got more pitching depth they've developed guys through the minor league system that they're going to call on some of that is with us right now uh, in nashville so it's a talented group here I think it's going to be a really good Milwaukee team. And I think, you know, they're, they're not picked to win that division by all the prognosticators because their closer, Devin Williams, is going to be out for a while. They don't have Burns and they don't have Woodruff. I think the Brewers can, can certainly be a team that, that quote unquote sneaks up on people because of the young talent in that lineup, like Terang and Freelick and Churio to go with Willie Adamas and Christian Yelich and, and William Contreras behind the plate. That can be a lineup that can steal a lot of bases, hit a lot of home runs, and just in general score a lot of runs from a pitching staff that I think is also going to be better than people realize. And where that that another year of contending in Milwaukee is also going to come from is who they're going to need down here. And so the Sounds players have to be ready, and I think it's a group that is hungry to get to the big leagues and show that that they can belong just like all the other guys that we've seen come through here the last couple of years. Okay. Tell me, does this look familiar? You got the Brewers game on right now. There you Bingo. go. Absolutely. There you go. We got Brewers Absolutely. twins in the big leagues and we got sounds in St. Paul triple A for the twins against the sounds here these next few days. So Brewers twins all over the place. So are you prepared for God only knows what from Kelly? <laughs> <laughs> yes. And, and maybe Look, no. <laughs> I, I'm interested to see what I'm going to say as well, because I'm not really sure here. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> that was hey, so, 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 Jeff, I'm looking at the roster. Like, is it, is it a total overhaul every year? I mean, I, I don't. I'm sure there's some there's some names that I saw last year, but like I don't see many of the names that I saw last year. Is it is it a total overhaul year in and year out? It, it yes and no. I would say right now about half the roster has been a sound yeah. before. Some of those guys though were from the very end of last year, um, or in some cases even maybe two like 2022, but not last year. Um, you know, so 
there, in general, every year, you're going to have a good chunk of players who were back, who are back from the previous season. But then, and this is where the Brewers are so good, um, waiver claims, minor league free agents, trades, um, they of, of restocking that system. You, you're rarely going to have a roster full of, on a 28-man roster, it's rarely going to be full of prospects. You need to have some guys who are maybe a little bit more big league ready to go up for a few days um, versus the prospects who you're thinking, hey, in a couple of years, this guy can be an everyday big leaguer. You need that combination of options down at AAA. So um, it's about half the roster is is new from outside the organization or just new to the sounds coming up through the Brewers system. And, and about half are guys that would have been a sound at some point in the past, but some of that is more, you know, more games played as a sound than others. So it's part of what AAA makes AAA so fascinating. It's it's a melting pot, and it's going to come and go over the course of the year. Uh, by the end of the season, there might be a handful of guys who will turn out to have been here all year. Other guys might be here a week or two weeks or two months, um, and a lot of that just depends on the health of the big league club and performance that forces the hand for a call-up or a trade um, or some other kind of transaction that the, the brewers, in this case, would decide to make. So, so last year, with some of the rule changes that happened in Major League Baseball, it always starts in the minor leagues with the pitch clock, with something to do with the bases, like we talked about. What what rule changes are new this year that they're going to try to implement in the Major League Baseball that's starting in the minor leagues? Yeah, they're continuing this year here where we left off last year with the pitch clocks. Um, you know, they've got the the pitch clock. I'm sorry, not not the pitch clock, the, uh, the challenge, the ball strike challenge system. They have the pitch clocks at the big league level, which you're right, started down here. Um, down here this year, it's another season of testing out the automatic ball strike system, which gets used for the Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday games where the plate umpire wears an earpiece and the the um, the Hawkeye system, internal system of computers behind the scenes signals to the umpire uh, whether it's a ball or strike, and he just relays what the technology gave him. So that's the Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday games, just like last year. And then the same format for the Friday, Saturday, Sunday games involving the ball strike challenge system, uh, which has gotten great reviews and feedback, I think, uh, almost universally preferred uh, that over the ABS, the automatic system. And in the challenge system, the plate umpire calls balls and strikes like has been, like been done for 100 years. Um, but in this case, both teams get three challenges where right away the pitcher and catcher or the batter, if they object to a call, can challenge it. Just like last year, they, they tap their head quickly after a strike that they think was a ball or a ball that they think was a strike. You make the challenge call quickly up on the video board. Everybody can see the simulation of the pitch and uh, it either you know gets upheld or it's overturned and the count changes if based on the, the outcome. So both teams get three challenges. There's some strategy to that that I think has been really well received. Um, if you win a challenge, you keep it, similar to the NFL in that regard. So, you know, you could be out of challenges by the fourth inning. And if base is loaded bottom of the eighth, uh, you feel an egregious call was made against you. If you're out of challenges, you wear it. So there's a strategy to not risking too many challenges early in the game. Um, but so all of that, uh, I think MLB wants another year of AAA baseball utilizing that um, to see what they might want to do down the road at the big league level. I would imagine someday at the big league level, if I had to guess, mm -hmm. that ball strike challenge system would get implemented in some way, shape or form. I'd be surprised if it ever went to the full on automated system where the plate umpire's job and calling balls and strikes is is meaningless in that sense. Um, I love the challenge system. Everybody I've asked about it over the last year plus has loved the challenge system. But at least for now, um, MLB wants another season of half the time it's the automated system, and the other half the time it's it's the challenge system. So, so is the player the guy? Is is he the one that challenges, or is the that's, coach? Like, yeah, does he have to give him like a signal? Does he have to like give a signal to the coach that I think that was a strike, or? Does the player do that? Because if I'm a coach yeah. and you're just calling stuff, I'm going to like be a really upset if you screw well, it up. Yeah, and that's why that's why everybody loves it so much. And I mentioned there's a strategical component to this. The player has to do it. 
Um, you know, if oh, I'm, okay. if I'm the, if, if Kelly, if you're the pitcher and I'm the catcher and you throw a pitch that was called a ball and you or I thinks it's a strike, you or I can quickly signal that we want to challenge it. If the plate umpire in this case thinks you or I either waited too long because it's got to come right away. If, if the umpire thinks you and I waited too long or thinks that we are being influenced by somebody from the dugout saying, oh, that was a ball challenge or that was, you know, that was a strike challenge that the plate umpire will not let the challenge go forward. So to your point, the pitching coach and the manager and anybody else in their dugout um, plays no role in this. It's either the batter oh, wow. feeling like a strike was a ball or the pitcher catcher, some form of that combination. Um, and a lot of pitchers will say, because, you know, think about it, you know, from a from a professional athlete standpoint, in your perspective, Kelly, like the pitcher always thinks it should have been a strike. Pitchers will, they've told me, I leave it up to my catcher because otherwise I'll run us out of challenges right away because you're so in the moment yeah. and passionate and competitive and it's easy to convince yourself a lot of pitches were a strike. So a lot of time, nine times out of 10 out of that pitcher-catcher combo, it's the catcher who received it and might have a little bit better and maybe more uh, less subjective in a sense um, viewpoint of what he thought it was. A lot of times the catcher will call for it, but it's got to come right away. So there's, it doesn't really impede the pace of play. It doesn't take five minutes to figure out what it was. Quick challenge call five seconds later, it's playing up on the video board for the entire ballpark to see where it was kind of like the tennis ball coming in. Did it land on the line or just outside the line? You see it up on the video board and either, okay, umpire was right or umpire was wrong, whatever it was, and everybody moves on. It's quick. And it's like there's that. strategy to it. It's, it's, it's fabulous. There's, there's nothing. That's kinda, and, that, go ahead. So sorry. That, that seems a little shaky to me, leaving it up to the player, because if you got like a guy like George, George is going to be up there going, Hey, I want to, I want a shot. It wasn't a strike. I want to call. I want it to do over. You know, I just can't. I don't know how you allow the players to do that, but maybe it's good. I don't know. We'll see. Well, they've got the better angle for it, for one thing. I mean, if you're standing on the mat, you know, think, picture it from the manager's standpoint of the third base dugout, that side view of home plate, you don't want him thinking it was, you know, if it was outside corner, that's tough to see from the side. So the angle's better for the pitcher and catcher. But it also is just a quicker, a quicker process. But I mean, to your point, uh, our manager Rick Sweet has said he he basically tells his guys unless we've got you know bases loaded in the second inning and we're looking at a big inning, he basically tells them, look, don't try not no. to challenge anything in the first few right. innings of the game because the last thing you want is that ninth inning moment where something egregious happens and you're out of challenges. So. Again, right. I love – that's why I like the strategy component to it. I think it's fun. I think the fans can – once the fans learn about it and realize what's going on, and that'll take time, um, you know, they can – you know, we're all – everybody's sort of part of it when you see it up on the video board, what the outcome was. So do we get the uh, obligatory stadium shot before we end? Oh, yeah. Let me see if I – There we go. Can I, can I reverse my camera on this? Let me try – how do I do that? I know we went through this last year at one point. You're asking me? <laughs> Good Lord. I don't think you can. Uh, I think you'll just have to have to. Oh, he turned turn my phone it, around. But, That's what we yeah. did last year. Yeah. So there there we go. Okay, so there it is. The tarp is on yeah. the field right now. You can see a little bit of brightness in the sky, and the players yeah. are out. You know, the players are trying to take advantage of their time now because I do think it's going to rain again here in a little bit. So they're trying to get some work done now while it's not raining, and uh, and then we'll see. But it's, so is, it's, the, is the best way for a fan to find out, go to NashvilleSounds.com? Yeah, um, social media. We, we post things the moment we find out anything. Um, if you're not seeing anything on the social media channels, that means the game is you know still on and still planning to be played. But if yeah. like, you know, the weather delay, we post things on social media. Um, and then once I go on the air at 620, I go on the air on time, whether we're going to be delayed or not. Um, and so I go on at 620 for a 635 first pitch and I'll give, you know, all we know at that point, if we are in some sort of a delayed start tonight, but the social media channels, um, are the, are the best spot to look first. If you're looking for immediate updates, um, that's the best way to go. Beautiful. It's good to have you on again. It's good to have baseball back. I agree on both fronts. Appreciate you guys as always. Absolutely. Jeff, him very talented. 
play-by-play -play voice of the sounds. If you've never heard him before, a major league yeah. baseball announcer on the minor league level, and as I have said before, taking that jump from minor league to major league is the toughest broadcast leap in sports. It just really? is. Oh, yeah. mile. Man, he's really good, though. I've done a game with yeah. him up in – up in. Uh, we were in Chattanooga last year, and he's really good. He's really prepared, really organized, asks really good questions. Uh, he, he's good at what he does. Good guy, well, too. Are we now ready for plaster bed of the day? Yes, we are. Plaster there Bet of the Day brought to you by Bart Durham Injury Law. Let's check it out. See what happened last night. I think we already brought this up, but LSU goes down. Mm, sorry, George. Yeah. Well, <laughs> you know, but, uh, you have to be like a short reliever. If you suck on Monday, you got to be superb on Tuesday. Okay, Short we'll memory. see. So, here's the deal. The NIT in years gone by, you would go to Madison Square Garden for the final two games, for the semifinals and the finals. Billy, help me with this. A year ago, didn't they go to Vegas? Yeah, they were in Vegas last year. And now, so, they're, in, now they're in Indianapolis. This year, they chose Indianapolis. And, oh, by the way, Indianapolis and Terre Haute, Indiana, where Indiana State's located, not all that far. Result, Hinkle Fieldhouse is sold out tonight. Yeah. Will yeah. Purdue will be on the radio, the national radio call of the game. I'm taking Indiana State simply because they've got the home advantage, and it's a big one. They'll have about 8,500 in there. That old field house, that's a great old barn for basketball. Um, it, it just is. It's Butler's uh, home gym, Hinkle Fieldhouse. I just think Indiana State at home is going to win. George, isn't that where they filmed the movie Hoosiers at yep. Hinkle Fieldhouse? Yeah, they, uh, they, they, if you remember, the Hickory team right. goes there for – I don't know if it's the semifinals, then the finals. And there's a scene where they walk in there. Yeah, it's and finals. All starstruck. Yeah. And, um, yeah. And so, Gene Hackman pulls out Gene Hackman pulls out the tape and he, he yeah. measures the measures the line, then he measures the height of the rim. And he said, I think you'll find these same measurements back in our yeah. gym in Hickory. Good stuff. Good movie. Good stuff. Well, not a good movie. It's a classic. Game two, I just think Seton Hall is better than Georgia. I, I'll admit I'm shocked that Georgia is here. Billy, I wouldn't have given a nickel for their chances of getting here, but good for them. Good for Mike White. This probably helped their program some. Yeah, I had a feeling Mike White and Georgia were going to, you know, not give up, you know, not because a lot of times you get in an NIT, people stop playing. Um, I'd like to see a Georgia Indiana State. Uh, final. I think th those both those teams care, it seems like. But Seton Hall is pretty good. Yeah. Uh, so I'm taking Seton Hall and Indiana State. Kelly, we're done. See you. Billy, you did a great job today trying to navigate all of us uh, from our home uh, deals. Even though Kelly was never going to say that, I appreciate you. <laughs> Billy. You got it. I'm glad somehow we got we got George on the whole show without any interruptions. Kelly was the one with the interruptions. Bill, go get you Billy, go get you some warm milk and have mom mommy fluff up the pillow and your and your you know your mattress and coming. your bed cover and all that. You know what I'm saying? You'll be go okay. Turn, you'll be you may turn go turn Danielle Breezy off. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Apparently we channel. Need to have her own, we need to have her on one day, George, and tell her that you're trying to get her job. No, I'm not trying to get her job. Tomorrow, in the first hour, Terry McCormick will join us, and we will talk offensive line. The Titans have made some moves. They're going to have to make a few more. We'll talk about that. 
Then in the three o'clock hour, Mark McGee will join us after the Predators, hopefully, will have beaten the Boston Bruins. That game is tonight at Bridgestone. I will be there. Uh, may need a boat paddle to get there, but by golly, I'll be there. See y'all. See ya. <laughs>